Hello. Hello, everyone. How are we doing? I believe Hello. we are now live on on YouTube. Amazing. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, please say hi in the chat if you're watching. Let us know where you're from. Um, let us know if you're a teacher or a student um, or just interested in languages in general. Let me say hi. We're going to be answering questions during this webinar as well. So if you have questions, just leave them in the chat. We'll possibly be answering some as the presentation goes on. Um, so we've got a couple of people saying hi already. Hello. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm Adam. Um, I'm a teacher on italki here. Uh, I'm calling in from uh, Cardiff in the UK. Uh, and joining me today, we have uh, Michelle, uh, all the way from uh, Florida in the United States. Hello. It's nice to see all of you today, and it's exciting what we have to offer you. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to be dividing this uh, presentation into uh, two sections. So um, it's going to mostly be looking at creative, creative teachings of language. And we've decided to kind of split this into uh, two different perspectives. So one from a teacher perspective, and then one also from the uh, student perspective as well. And so uh, myself will be covering the student perspective later on. And uh, first of all, we're going to be looking at uh, teacher perspectives of creative teaching uh, with Michelle. But before I want to do that, um, before I hand over to Michelle to lead into the, the presentation, I just thought it would be good uh, just to introduce ourselves a little bit, just so you know who we are, what our backgrounds are with language, uh, and also teaching as well. Um, so as I mentioned before, my name is Adam. Uh, I'm from the UK. I actually started on italki uh, as a student uh, back in 2016, so almost four years ago now. And at the time, um, I was very interested into uh, self-study methods of language learning. I would learned uh, Chinese, and I used italki to help uh, learn Spanish. Uh, after uh, moving to Spain, um, I then began to actually teach English on italki and originally started as a community teacher uh, with no actual prior teaching experience and just sort of experimented with my own methods and practices from being a student. Um, in 2018, I then qualified as a, a ESL teacher, so a English as second language teacher, and I'm now a professional language teacher on italki and have also recently started learning uh, French as well. Uh, so most of my perspectives on this presentation are going to be from a teacher perspective and from how to implement self-study techniques as well. Um, Michelle, would you like to uh, introduce yourself and what we'll be talking about today? Yes, thanks, Adam. So as Adam mentioned, my name is Michelle and I live in Florida, in the state of Florida in the United States. And so today I'd like to discuss with you uh, different actual creative teaching methods, because as we all know, when we teach, uh, we have a plan, of course, but sometimes we need to be creative purposely or depending on the situation. So I would like to go over some different methods uh, concerning in the areas of reading, writing, listening and speaking. And then, of course, if you have any questions, um, we can review those as well. So um, as for me, um, as I said, I live in the United States and I've been with italki for over eight years and it's been quite a positive experience. Uh, I've taught over 5,000 lessons. I do have a master's degree in teaching English as a second language and I enjoy doing it on italki. So I'm ready to begin. Should we begin, Adam? Yeah, let's do it. Let's go straight into it. All right. So. So here we are with the creative teaching methods, okay? And as I said, I'm gonna go over actual methods from, from a teacher point of view. All right, so the first thing that I recommend to everyone is to get to know your student. This may seem quite obvious, but it's something that should be taken seriously uh, because you may have a long, a long road, a long journey together. You may have a short one, but you need to know how to adapt and to move forward. So I, I have a few things that I like to do personally. Um, when I meet a student, I like to take notes about them. 
Uh, because when you work with students, you may realize that sometimes you'll have a, um, a student relationship with them now and maybe not see them until four months from now. So taking notes, I think, is very useful. I like to use, personally, I like to use note cards, actually. And what I'll do is I'll write the student's name, I write where they're from, and I write their goals, okay? So that's a question that you really should ask in the very beginning. Uh, what are your goals? What are you interested in learning in English? So that you know that you're both on the same page. So again, on this note card here, I will write all the information I need to know. And as we're talking through the trial class or a regular class, I'll take other notes that may be, may be interesting down the road, the little road here again, um, that uh, maybe they like to dance or maybe they like to travel or maybe a particular student really enjoys taking pictures of airplanes, right? Those are little details that I think are important. The other thing that I always discuss with students because everyone is different on this is homework. Should you assign homework? Do they want homework? Do they have time for homework, okay? Um, I usually assign homework and then I let them choose if they have the time to do it. I, I don't give huge topics for homework uh, because I think that shorter shorter topics are better. And we can have that discussion too later on if, if longer or more homework is necessary. But have an honest conversation with your student. What, what I usually say, um, I, I work more with a, young adults and adults than actual children. So I would start the conversation with, you know, would, are you interested in homework, right? Would you like homework? And then I will say something like, um, again, I, I can assign you homework and we're both adults. If something happens in life and you're unable to do the homework, that's fine. We will still continue to work with our lessons. Let them know that because some people may get nervous or anxious. Ooh, I didn't have the time to uh, do my homework. My child was sick. We had to go to the doctor. And, and students get worried about that, but, but let them know what your expectations are for homework and what theirs are. Because if they do want homework, you need to also prepare and plan to give that homework to them. And then also for getting to know your student has to do with the schedule, their schedule. What do they, what, first of all, their schedule, what do they do on a daily basis? Are they extremely busy? Will they not have time to meet with you every day or every week? Understand where that's at. And that also can kind of play into homework too, right? How much homework is necessary? What, what's suitable? Um, so get an idea where you're at with that. All right, so let's move ahead. So the next thing would be activities. So once, you, you, once you've learned about your learner, you then need to know what is it that we're going to do, right? Um, it, again, in my mind, I always think of reading, writing, listening, speaking, and then in addition, whatever, whatever class topic they've signed up for. Is it TOEFL? Is it speaking? Is it writing? You have to have those things in mind. And the first point I'd like to make is to always be prepared, right? Um, what I mean by that is you, you need to go into the class, I would recommend, with two or three learning objectives. That way you can be assured to have a full class. And then, of course, that depends on how long the actual class is, right? Um, but I would go in with two to three learning objectives. And again, um, you, can, you can use note cards as I mentioned, and you can write activities on these note cards for these people, for these students that you would like to do with them, or you can have new ones and create different tasks that you wanna do, but always be prepared. And the next part of being prepared is to be flexible. <laughs> this is really important. Um, you may have a writing class with a student, but they don't wanna do writing they want to do speaking with you because the next day they're going to have a meeting uh, with, with a colleague in English, right? So, so be flexible. And then again, that goes back to how and why I like to use note cards. And um, I have two note cards. I have this one and I have this one. 
I, I actually prefer the larger one. So what you can do is you can think ahead because you always want to be prepared and you can take these cards and you can write on them some examples of writing activities on this one, for example, speaking activities on this one. So in case something changes quickly and you need some help, you can have these things right here with you. Now, examples of me being flexible. Uh, one example I can think of off the top of my head is I, I've had, believe it or not, several students that we have class while they're driving. <laughs> Um, and that, you know, that presents some difficulties. So if it's conversation, it's, it's fine. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm always a little nervous and I'm kind of watching their eyes, making sure that they're still focused on the road. Um, and if there would be something that, uh, they would need clarification on, I will write it in the chat box for them. And, and tell them they can look at it later <laughs> when, they, when they're actually stationary, right? Um, but I've had that happen many times. Also, within that particular situation, I had a student that needed a writing class and he was driving uh, because he was leaving work late. So it was great that he showed up to class, but it was difficult for him, obviously, to be writing. So what I decided to do was I had him orally tell me things and we discussed what would be a correct way or, or a better suggestion on how to write things. And I actually opened a Word document and I wrote everything in there for him instead. And then at the end of the class, I saved it and I sent it to him. So you have to kind of kind of be flexible on what could happen. So I've had people, um, I've had people uh, in cars many times I've had people at pools, <laughs> public pools. <laughs> um, I've also, for example, had students that uh, maybe the audio didn't work or the visual didn't work, and then we had to work with that or choose another platform to work on. Um, I've also had students where they wanted a conversation class, but they were not in a place to speak, so it turned into a writing class. So anything anything can happen so be prepared yeah i think um i think that's a, a really good point um because not just um in terms of preparing for the, the unexpected when it happens at the beginning of the lesson but also like during lesson as well things can um happen unexpectedly where maybe you can see um certain material maybe um the student is either finding difficult or challenging and you having that awareness to adapt on the fly in most kind of situations is is really useful. I was just gonna ask, cause um, we're getting comments um, on the chat about okay. about taking notes. Mm -hmm. um, so there seems to be a bit of a, a, bit of a split with um, like physical note taking and like digitally taking notes. Um, is there any preference or reason why you would use like the physical notes? Uh, some people are saying that they prefer to use like uh, Google Docs, and some people are also asking for alternatives to digital note taking. So, um, yeah, what, what's your like uh, method behind the, the physical cards? Well, my method is um, I'm I'm personally more of a paper person. Okay, and as I said, um, I can write different things on the card, and I will also actually show them what I'm doing that I'm writing instead of uh, looking down, and, mm -hmm. and so then they know um, that's me. Um, I do have different things that I will put on Google Docs or, or other, other things. But the other reason I do this is, for example, I can plan my day, too. So if I have, for example, three students, if I have three students, then I can prepare for each one. I know what they want to do. And then I can kind of keep that with me each time mm -hmm. I do my lessons, each, each class day. That's the other reason I like to do it. Or um, I keep a list of activities on here that we have done or suggestions of things to do in the future. So it's easy for me to grab because every day changes when you, when you work with the students, you will see new ones. And additionally, if um, you have a student that you see consistently and then you don't see them anymore, you can just kind of take them out of the rotation until they come back. 
Mm. That's, my, yeah. that's my take on it. Yeah, I, I don't think there's like a, a right way of doing it. Everyone's like complete uh, unique with their preferences on it. And we've also got Beth in the chat who, who's also uh, using paper as well. Mm -hmm. So nice one. I like to use my, um, I like to use my, my phone personally. I tried Google Docs, um, but for me, I find most comfortable is actually using the Notes app uh, on my phone. I'll create folders for, for different lesson types. Um, and I'll make a note of which students have already used those materials because sometimes you can cross and share them. Um, and these are more uh, teacher facing. I suppose for some of the people in the chat asking about Google Docs being shared with students, I think that's more like student facing, like um, for materials that you can show them and edit in real time. But there are some things that as a teacher, you maybe want to put in your prep notes that you, you don't want the student to necessarily see, but you need to be aware of. And so, Sometimes I'll just use the notes app on my phone, make some bullet points um, throughout the lesson, but they're more for my awareness rather than to actually show the students. Um, so you can kind of split them as you like, really, whatever works best for you. Yeah, exactly. I think it is whatever works best for you because you're the one who's going to be working with the students. So the way that you feel best prepared is the way that you should do it. But I'm a paper person. <laughs> All right. Um, anything else, Adam? Any other questions in that area? Um, I think we're good for now. I'll keep an eye on the chat. If you've got any other questions, guys, keep them, keep them coming in. OK. OK, so my next point I'd like to go over is to customize. Um, I think this is important because I think as a, as a teacher, we need to identify. We need to identify uh, what the student needs, right? So again, that goes back to uh, asking them questions about themselves, what they're interested in learning. So, for example, um, just recently I had a class with a student that is a dance instructor. And what's interesting about him is he's actually originally from Brazil, so he speaks Portuguese as his native language, uh, but he, now he's in France. So uh, some of his English actually was taking on a, a French accent a bit. So with this, we, we were discussing that he needs, he told me that he would like to work on verbs that specifically related to dancing, you know, as in move, bend, twist, right? And actually when he said um, it was bend, bend your knees, bend your knees, I actually heard bad, bad your knees. So that was something I took a note of that definitely we needed to work on those verbs. The other things for him would also be parts of the body. So, you know, hand, knee, ankle, um, head, arm. So parts of the body and how to pronounce them would be good because I know that, as he told me, he's teaching lessons uh, in person and also online. So having those keywords are very helpful for him. Um, and we discussed other, other points. Uh, other customization for activities, um, I have... Uh, an Italian businessman that I work with. And he actually lives in the United States and he's, he doesn't live in my state. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't live in my state, but he does business in my state. So there are different things that I can help him about. Um, for example, pronouncing different county names, different city names, but also what we've been doing is working with real estate. And I've been helping him with specific real estate terms. Um, and he specifically wants a writing class. So I will introduce to him some terms, some phrasal verbs that are very commonly used in the real estate industry, and we'll make some examples using those uh, orally and written together, right? So that he can practice that. And we will also uh, look at different house listings um, in the United States and discuss uh, different points to them, how big they are, because, for example, in the United States, we're going to express size differently than they would in, in other countries. So we'll have that discussion, which actually, um, another thing that I always keep near me is, um, is a ruler, believe it or not, because it's come up many times. Um, <laughs> Americans, we don't use the metric system, right? <laughs> so, yeah, so I can relate up, to this one. <laughs> it's come up many times. Yeah. So I can just pull this out and I can say, okay, wow, this is this is six inches, which would be the equivalent of about 15 centimeters, right? Um, and, and it's a nice visual. And of course, if it needs to be a larger amount, we can convert that. 
um, on, on Google or something. Um, another another um, customized class as an example would be, I've had many personal trainers and many nutritionists. So with that, uh, I, I know that in their, their line of work, they would work with a lot of supplements or vitamins, for example. So, you know, you can do activities with them where you can actually literally talk about these kinds of things. And you can ask questions like, what is a sub, what's the difference between a supplement and a vitamin? You can go through, you can go through the ingredients of different, different, uh, supplements and vitamins that you have and ask them to explain them and, and talk about them. So it's, it's important to really realize what they want and what they're doing. Mm, we've, um, we've got two really good points, but I think, uh, two questions, sorry, that have come up in the chat. So sure. I think we can use this point to elaborate on, to answer them slightly. So, um, we've got one question from, um, from Daniel, uh, saying that if you have a student who wants to practice talking, but uh, maybe their answers are short. Um, how can you motivate them to keep talking? And I think you've answered that already in a way because what you're talking about is just asking questions um, and try to restrict the type of, of closed questions that you are asking and ask more open-ended questions. Questions where the student can't really give a one-word answer. Um, and you can also phrase them um, rather as opening statements, um, rather than actual yes or no type questions. So when you mentioned just then, Michelle, like uh, with the differences between supplements and vitamins, you could phrase this as, tell me about the differences between this and that, like um, explain Correct. to me how this works or that works. And um, focusing more on the, the angle in which you ask the questions will help uh, push the student to keep speaking. Um, and then the other question, which I, I think uh, would would be quite good to uh, to look into, because you're talking about some really good um, creative ways of um, matching the students' like need for the language. Um, do you have any advice if, for example, uh, you were to use these methods, but um, maybe the student doesn't necessarily like um, like the the creative aspect of it, and maybe um, prefers a different way? Um, how do you adapt in those situations? Say that you have something prepared and you think the student's really going to find this useful and then um, the feedback isn't as positive as you expected. Uh, how do you deal with those kinds of situations? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so usually after, at the end of the first class, I'll usually ask for feedback. I will say, you know, how is how was this class? Did you like it? Was it good? Would you like to change something? I always let them know that I'm open to changing something. Yes, you may have students that are more traditional. They want something from a book. They want something solid. And that's true. But uh, one of the ways I've come across it is uh, I've actually just made um, two kinds of activities, really solid ones and then really creative ones. But I've also explained for the creative ones why we're doing it. So, for example, an easy question could be if if you know this student has difficulty with the past tense in English or difficulty with irregular verbs in English, I can say, uh, please tell me about your weekend because I know everything will be in the past tense. Right. And I will say this. This is one way we can do uh, a verbal check on your past tense. So so I'm telling you right there. That's why I'm asking you that. So sometimes I think it's about communication and to split mm. activities. And if it if it doesn't seem to work and the student wants more traditional activities, then go in that direction. Yeah, so all, all open communication with your, your students. Don't be afraid to ask the uncomfortable question of, did you actually enjoy today's lesson? Uh, what would you change? What worked? What didn't? Um, that's the only way that you're going to have a longer lasting uh, relationship with your student and that they're going to see that you're actively trying to uh, meet their needs. You might not get it all the time and sometimes you can be transparent with that if you maybe have like a first lesson with a student you test some different uh different exercises or activities um, you can even say to them like we're going to try a couple different things let me know what works what doesn't and i'll adjust as we go along and what you'll find is as the lessons go on you'll get a much better sense of what that student likes um so that's yes. what i recommend a absolutely, absolutely. Ask ask for feedback because you may also be surprised things that you didn't think were so great or things that you thought were not important, they actually really enjoyed. 
um, which then goes into choose appropriate activities together. So if your student has a reading class and that student wants to read a book, that's great. Then, then that's what you're going to be working on. Um, but if they want to read a book, but they but they really want a writing class, then you need to make sure how to figure how to incorporate what they want with an appropriate activity. All right. So I'm going to continue. Okay. So as I said, I want to go over some ideas we can look at for reading, writing, listening, and speaking. Uh, again, most of the, not all, but most of the students I work with are young adults or adults, professional adults. So if we look at creative ideas for reading, uh, one of them I could say would actually be the student's company website. There's a lot of information in there. There are a lot of uh, verbs. There's a lot of great pronunciation. So maybe you can look at the, um, the, uh, the, the page where it talks about all the team members. Um, who they are and the student can actually read that to you, right? And then you can ask, oh, well, how do you work with this? How do you work with this colleague? So you can learn more in that way. So you're working on pronunciation, you're working on reading skills out loud, of course, um, and you're learning about the student and how the company works together. Also, if it's a business English class, this is appropriate. And it's, it's a way for you also to learn in depth more about what they do. So again, you can customize lessons. Another point for reading um, I recommend is local news. This can go both ways. Uh, again, I live in the United States, so we could read about local news in the United States because it's in English, right? Or if my student is in Germany, for example, I can Google um, uh, Berlin news in English and I will be able to find that. So it's a bit of a twist because they may know in German what's going on in their town or their country, but now we can talk about it in English. So there's a reading activity we can do. Another reading activity could be a job posting. Uh, there are obviously many websites out there that, that post jobs, but if you can get your student to tell you what job they're doing, what's the title, you know, or what it is that they want. So if it's a job interview class, for example, and uh, we're looking ahead at what position they want, then we can go into, for example, Indeed, um, Indeed.com or Monster.com, whichever one. We'll go in, we'll find the job. We can look through a few. And it's great because they can read about uh, what the company's about, a brief overview. They can read about what, what the job is looking for and then other qualifications. So you get a lot of activities there. Now, if you have a younger learner, um, you may want to do something completely different. <laughs> you may want to do some reading about animals, right? Even adults like animals though too. So animals, um, you could, you could first, you could look, you can find a zoo. You can find a zoo anywhere in the world as long as you can get information in English. And you can look on the internet together and read about the zoo what they believe in, where it's located, which kinds of animals they have. Um, you can also go to Wikipedia, for example, and read about monkeys, right? Maybe the student really, really likes monkeys, or maybe even they're a biologist, right? And, and they work with, with monkeys. So there's, there's lots of different angles you can go with that. Um, if you have a younger learner, a younger learner might really like reading about celebrities. For example, I have a student that loves Billie Eilish. <laughs> and I have learned a lot about Billie Eilish since I've met her. So um, this is about finding activities that they like. So we've tapped into that area and I know that she really likes it. So we've read about her, we've read about her life, we've reviewed her lyrics, we've discussed what some of her lyrics mean, we've watched some of her music videos, um, but it's been pretty cool because even I learned something. All right. Any questions, Adam? Um, so we're getting a few, um, but there's one uh, which I found kind of uh, relevant to what we're, we're talking about right now from, from BookTube, which is saying, um, if you experience someone whose work or talk subject maybe is something that's not familiar to you, uh, how do you deal with it in that kind of situation? So, I mean, you were talking about it there with, with Billie Eilish um, and 
I certainly have plenty of occasions where people's um, jobs or backgrounds are completely different to what I'm familiar with. And I think you 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 said it kind of perfectly there. It's that you you share that with the the student. You you have a, a curiosity about it. You ask them questions. You you kind of explore the topic together, and you kind of get them to show you their kind of uh, their world or their interests or or work. Um, it's not about um, you already knowing it and uh, teaching them it. It's them showing you things and you kind of guiding them through that in a way. So um, there are certain topics where students might ask for that they might need to know about. And I might not know much about it in all honesty, but from visual cues and from like what uh, Michelle was saying with videos, you can look at stuff together and you can usually uh, understand in that sense and help then explain it into other terms and, and ask questions. Um, so yeah, I would say be curious um, and ask a lot of questions. <laughs> for that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Be curious, ask a lot of questions. I do have something coming up a little bit later on that kind of gets into that too. Um, but again, I'm going to talk about my note cards again. <laughs> one of the one of the things I like to do when I meet students for the first time is I like to ask, "Tell me what is a typical day like for you," and that goes into also open ended questions. So when I ask that question, I want to know everything. You know, what time do you get up? How do you get, if you go to work, how do you get to work? What time do you start work? Do you work in a traditional office? Um, and what do you do, right? So I can get a lot of information too from that first question, where again, I'm going to put and take some notes and on, put it on the note cards. But yes, very good. Thanks, Adam. No okay, so I'm going to continue on to writing, all right? So as for writing, um, if we look at somebody that is a professional, uh, activities I've done is I have written practice emails with those students. I've helped them with that. As I mentioned, I live in Florida and I have a student that lives in Miami and she works in human resources. And I know, because this happens every year here, I know that we have a hurricane or we have a hurricane warning. So what we did is I asked her to write a practice email uh, that she would need to send out to the company that states what, what would happen in the event of a hurricane. What's the protocol? Who, who needs to work? Should you report to work? Uh, what should you be prepared about, right? So we did several practice emails regarding inclement weather, actually. And her hurricanes were one of those examples. Um, a student may not have the time to write you an email, right? You can always use um, in, in class time, okay? Which, by the way, let me mention it. If I do a writing class uh, where we write in class at the same time, because I, I like to break it up that I give you a homework assignment and that we also do some writing in class, I won't spend 40 minutes sitting here while they write. I give them short things for them to write, a few sentences, a few vocabulary words, or maybe a little paragraph, but I won't, I won't spend the whole time for them writing. Um, but back to that, um, if they don't actually have time to write an email, you can ask them to go in their old emails if they're okay with it and find something that they have written. And if there's any confidential information, they can just black it out. So you don't even need to have access to that. And you can review those emails. You can, you know, correct grammar. You can suggest other words. Um, you could find keywords that are very simple. You can look into a thesaurus and you can find better and more appropriate words. You can help them with that. Um, on to point two for vocabulary sentence creation. This is exactly what I was just mentioning. You can do it for vocabulary words or phrasal verbs. Um, a lot of times keywords are good, okay? And, and have them write a sentence for you. Very simple. Um, I actually physically have them write it instead of them orally telling me because that's part of the writing class, right? And also you can check spelling when you see that. Um, another thing I really like to do is writing prompt cards. This works for, in my opinion, all ages. So I'm going to talk about my note cards again. <laughs> okay. So um, I actually have some writing prompt cards and I have some conversation prompt cards that I bought a long time ago. You can search for something like that on the internet or you make your own. Okay. So what you can do with the student is you can say, okay, I have, I have three writing prompt cards here. 
right? And you're going to have written on them questions. Uh, what's your, this is just simple. What's your favorite food and why? Um, what, what do you like most about your job? And where's the best place to take a vacation? Depends on what kind of class you're having, of course. So I can hold it this way where they don't see anything, right? And they say, okay, I want this one, right? And then I say, okay, you chose this one, right? Now, I can have these cards here, but if I know if I know that they're stronger in one area or the other, I could they say I want this one and I say okay. Well, I may pull it down and actually choose another one that I think is a more appropriate topic for them sometimes. I'll do that. It depends. This is really good for young adults, for kids actually too. They they like stuff like this. It's fun because they can participate. Um, writing a short play or scenario. This can go either way of young adult or professional. Um, if you write uh, a scenario, it could be something like a, a technical process that your student may do. They may write, you know, step one, two, and three. You're looking at verbs. You're looking at prepositions here. You're looking at correct sentence structure, of course, spelling. Um, or you can go on the side of write a short play. You could have a student that writes a short play for you with two characters. That would be the writing part. And then if you're actually going to be reviewing it for speaking, right, you each can play a part and then switch roles. Um, another thing I like to do, which works with children and adults, is describing pictures or write a story. So if we're describing pictures, I can have, I can have something. I, I can go, you know, in a newspaper, in a magazine, whatever, and I can actually get pictures or I have something like these, depending on who, who you're working with, right? Right. So you can say, okay, so this is this is mother, right? Can you write me one sentence about maybe this mother? You can describe her or your mother, or you can make it a relationship. So this is this is father, for example, and this is mother. Can you write me a little story about father and mother, right? So if you're going to do this way, um, give them some parameters of what to do with. And again, you're going to decide the timing of your class. You're going to decide, you're going to decide your objectives. So you're going to know if that's better to use as an in-class assignment or something that's homework. And um, one other thing about homework before I forget is usually when I do assign homework, I always write it in the chat. Now, if you're using Skype, that's fine. If you're using the italki platform, that's fine. But I always write it in there so that it's written and we, when we both come back, we, we know exactly where, where we're going. Um, but yeah, so, uh, and then like, as I said, you could take pictures out of a magazine or newspaper, you hold them up, you show them. Okay, so we have, we have some apples here and we have some children, right? So write me a story about apples and children, right? All right, so I'm going to continue. Are we okay to continue, Adam? Yeah, we're um, we are good. We're getting some questions. I think some of these questions are really good, and I think some of them I'm going to touch on in in my section in a bit. So I'm going to hold off asking them just yet. Um, but as we go on to listening, we did get some questions earlier, uh, early on as well about audio mm -hmm. uh, and audio resources. Um, so. This would be a good one to, to go into for everyone who wanted to know what, what audio um, materials that you share with students and how you do that. So um, yeah, I think we're good at the moment. Great, thank you. Okay, so as for listening, um, I hear a lot about it. I do recommend it. It's not my favorite resource, but it's out there and it's really good. Um, it's TED Talks. So the reason I like TED Talks is because TED Talks will have lots of different topics and they're speakers from around the world. Now, this is part of the preparation. Um, I will usually like to go in and choose one, but I also try to find one that is a native English speaker. But now, if my student is having difficulty with people of other um, native English uh, speaking, for example, somebody that's a native of Cardiff, for example, or a native of the United States, um, I will go in and I will find speakers of, of those, those accents for them. Depends on what they're looking for. But if I know that they just want a native English speaker, um, no one else, as an American, right? No other accent, I will go in and I will choose those, okay? Um, 
TikToks are good. They do have captions, which are nice, but they're not always 100% accurate. So it's difficult for the students sometimes to go back and, and find certain spots because the words may not be right. So I'd let them know that. I let them know that for me, it looks like it's about 85 to 90% correct. Uh, another thing you can do is local news from different countries or even local news from your own country, uh, my country. Uh, if I go into any local news station, I've noticed that they also have the captions in there. Um, and then you can review those with the students. So for these, you can assign them as homework or you can do certain things in class. I would never do an entire TED Talk, TED Talk presentation in the class for 30 minutes and we just sit there. No. Um, if, I, if I wanted to do it a little bit longer, I would break it up. I would preview it and I'd break it up maybe three minutes and then we can stop it and then we can talk about, okay, well, what did you, what did you understand? What is this about? Um, I like to ask percentages. Uh, what percentage of the conversation did you understand? 100%, 70%, 65%, right? And sometimes it gets kind of fun. 78.2%, <laughs> right? Um, so that's something for you to keep in mind as you go through, but I would never just straight do that. I would kind of break it up and that's sometimes kind of nice. Um, on to pronunciation points. So if I'm working with pronunciation with a student and we've just been practicing, for example, how to pronounce ED, which by the way, does have three different endings in English. Um, in a pronunciation class, I would have reviewed those. We would have practiced them, but then I would find listening, listening examples for them. It could be a Ted talk. It could be local news. And I could say to them, okay, well, listen to the three different endings, right? They just said walked, right? They just said walked. They said needed, right? Did you hear that? So you're, you're pointing them in the right direction to focus on what it is you want them to hear. Or even maybe TH, right? Because not everybody believes that TH think we really do that, but we do. <laughs> so if you turn off the sound on any on any uh, audio, if you, if you have a video, right? If you turn it off, you'll you'll see that, okay? So it also helps reinforce pronunciation. Then you can go to transcript writing. Um, again, I always try to find uh, an audio or visual source if I can that does have captions or does have subtitles, warning them that there may be a few inconsistencies with how it was picked up, but at least it gives them also something they can go back to. Um, and if it is a transcript writing project, it's very short you know, maybe, maybe a minute, maybe two. Um, otherwise it gets boring, right? Uh, but just, just a little bit to see what they're hearing. But here, this also gives you an idea. If they never pick up p -p 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 party or p -p -p please or p -p pretty, you know, there's an issue with uh, listening for the P sound. So it helps you identify things as well. Hmm. Hi, Adam, anything? Um, so just on the TED talk, we've got a couple uh, a couple bits and uh, comments about um, mm -hmm. so um, about the transcript and also the filter features on on the on the TED site, but also when you mentioned, for example, the uh, the transcripts as well mm -hmm. um, on the TED website. Um, this is great for pronunciation. You can if you click on the the website for the TED talk and click the transcript, you can click on certain sentences on the transcript, and it will actually play the part of the video where the person said it. So as Michelle was saying earlier, when you say like, okay, what percentage do you understand? Can you show me the areas where maybe you didn't quite pick up what the person was saying? The student can actually really pinpoint exactly where it is. You can play it back with them. You can explain the context or any words that maybe aren't clear or um, if they're like uh, idioms or phrasal verbs that don't have direct translation um, to what they're actually saying, you can break it down in its meaning. Um, so that's a great way of doing that. Uh, we also then have um, a question from uh, Maribel, which is, uh, how useful is it to use recording following the transcription? Is it good to put them together or separately? Um, the I don't know how you like to do this, Michelle. For me personally, I usually um, will play the audio first and use the transcript as a follow-up uh, then afterwards, um, just to give the student a chance to have audio only and then use the transcript as like a, a guide if they need it. But what's your what's your approach when you're using those TED Talks? Do you use them simultaneously or separate? No, no, I would 
definitely not have the transcript first because you need to get an idea of how much they understand, right? So for example, if you if you don't have it, how what percentage do you understand? Oh, I understand 70%, right? And then if you do turn on the the, the transcript or the captions, uh, okay, I understand 85%, right? So it tells me also, is it vocabulary we're not familiar with? Is it is it listening? What is it? Um, I also don't like to use them as a crutch. So I would tell students if, if they're doing this as an activity at home on their own free time, I would recommend that if they do feel they need to have these captions or, or uh, transcripts, don't use them all the time. Maybe just the first 10 minutes and then see how much you understand. Because I think people um, get really um, comfortable with that. And then what I mention is life doesn't come with a transcript. <laughs> so you need to get really comfortable without it. But so I would do, I wouldn't do it in the beginning. And then I would do a mix later on to see how people feel to kind of wean them off them. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, I mean, I, I agree. You need to give the student the, the independence to try it first. Um, and then you've got a safety net if they don't necessarily understand from the audio. Um, in a similar way to, you know, if you were to watch a film, um, subtitles might not be the default, but you can use them as a fallback if you need that extra clarification. Um, you want to encourage the student to be independent without those visual aids and guides as much as possible. But they're great um, as a way of um, kind of lowering the, the difficulty so that the student can feel more engaged. So the, the difficulty threshold isn't so high that the student feels like, oh, it's impossible. I'm not going to understand it. It's a really great way to keep it engaging for the student. So I would say just judge that based on how they're finding the material. If it's too difficult, maybe introduce it a little bit more um, and just play it play it by student. Yeah, great. That's great, Adam. Thank you. And the last point I want to make for um, listening is you could use, for example, Billy Irish music lyrics. <laughs> okay? You could listen to those. Um, and then you can also have a student uh, write lyrics out too for you. Um, and then you you could go back and forth and you can actually say these lyrics to each other and, the, and then they can listen in. Um, but tapping into music, um, you know, is really nice uh, for, for young adults, I think. All right, let's continue. All right, so speaking, this is a pretty big one. All right, so in my opinion, the great thing about the speaking is it really can blend into the other things. I can ask you, for example, a question and you can write it for me. You can read the question uh, and then we can do some writing or we can just continue with speaking. Um, but this is, even though speaking seems easy to do, again, it has to have, um, it has to have a target, it has to have a goal, and it, you have to plan out what it is that you really wanna talk about. So the first point I have here is conversation topics with targeted vocabulary. So again, if I know somebody needs to work on the past tense, again, I'm gonna ask that question. So tell me about your weekend. So it is a speaking topic, but it's also, I know what we're looking for. Um, if, if it's again about ED, right? So we're, we're trying to make sure that the student has it pretty solid on the pronunciation of ED. That's another thing. I'm gonna ask you a question for the past tense. Um, if it's a, um, a travel related question, right? I, I can say, well, what, you're going to be visiting Italy next week. So what things are you going to bring with you? Okay. Or one that I also like to use uh, if you're going to travel is tell me about how you get on the airplane. And then we start with like arriving at the airport, right? So we arrive at the airport, we go to see the ticket agent. I check my bag in, I go through security, uh, I get on the airplane, but I go through all the details, all the details. And then also the key vocabulary word when you're on the airplane. So you have to go down the aisle, right? Aisle is a big, is a big top, topic of conversation. Which, which seat do you like in the airplane, right? The window, the middle, um, the aisle seat, right? Um, also, you can go over a tray table, lavatory. What's a lavatory, right? So there's, there's a lot of targeted things depending on what they're doing. Um, and then again, I went into point two already about um, having the student tell you about the weekend. Uh, asking open-ended questions, super important. Uh, one, because you may get things that you didn't know that are very useful and that will add to future lessons. So again, um, 
asking the question, uh, what's a typical, this is one that I typically ask, what's a typical day like for you, right? Um, that tells me a lot of things about the students and uh, it tells me um, things that we can build on later. Uh, this also goes with the conversation cards that I was talking about earlier, where you can basically um, you know, have them guide you. Which question do you want? Do you want question one, two, or three, right? And then you read the question out loud. You can, again, uh, you can get these things on the internet. You can find them. They're called speaking topics, or you can, you can even take, again, the writing prompts, right? You can use the writing prompt question and use it as a speaking question, um, as long as it's open-ended. And if it is closed, do you prefer apples or bananas? Why? <laughs> and the answer may be, oh, because I ate an apple with my grandmother every day when I was little, right? Um, what's your favorite kind of ice cream, right? Oh, well, I really like chocolate and I like, oh, I don't remember the word strawberry, right? So now that's pulling us into fluency. And then that question has more. Well, how often do you eat ice cream? Well, I don't eat ice cream a lot because, because, oh, it's too many calories. It's too much fat. Oh, okay. Um, but, you know, now, now that I think about it, um, I used to eat a lot of ice cream when I was with my grandmother uh, when I was a child. So you get, you get grammar, you get fluency through those open-ended questions. You just kind of have to, to, to keep them going. Um, another thing has to do with current event topics. So recently in the United States, we had Halloween. So we got to talk a lot about Halloween. And it's interesting to see, for me, which countries uh, participate in Halloween, which don't, and how they do it. Uh, I find that Halloween in other countries seems to be scarier <laughs> than in the United States. <laughs> We're focused on all sorts of costumes, not just the scary ones. Um, but an activity that I have for that is uh, we always talk about pumpkins, right? Carving a pumpkin. Um, and right there, when we talk about carving a pumpkin, um, I actually use the word carve right? Because we're going to use carve for, for meat. We're going to use it for carving the pumpkin. Um, but in other instances, I'm actually going to use the verb to cut, right? So it depends, it depends on how we're doing that. And with um, carving the pumpkin, for example, I have an activity where I have the different steps on how to carve a pumpkin. But what I will do is I will put them out of order, and then we will discuss what the actual correct order is on how to do it. The next one, oh, in current events, that could be for business, for business as well. Um, uh, I, I work with a lot of individuals that work for Google, Amazon, Bosch, all, the, all these companies. So current event topics in their company, in their field, or current event topics in the world, right? So soon, for example, in the United States, we're going to have our Thanksgiving holiday. And it means after that, we're going to have Black Friday where everybody's shopping. So Amazon is a big topic <laughs> after that. Um, all right, moving on to role play. Role play is really good. Uh, role play usually would be more with a professional that I'm working with. Um, I've done this many times with doctors, actually, uh, where we we just, you know, I can be the patient, the doctor can be the doctor, and uh, I can, you know, tell the doctor what I'm feeling, what's wrong with me, and then the doctor will ask me more questions based on that. But that could be anything. You can do role play within a meeting. You know, tell me, tell me about this, um, this um, chart or graph that you have for your next upcoming meeting, and then I can ask questions about it. Well, what does this figure mean? What does this number mean? Why are we negative in this area, right? Um, which blends into the next one, prepare and practice a presentation or academic um, topic. So uh, an academic presentation uh, would be really about obviously anything academic. And maybe a student has to give a presentation in the, air, in, a, in the physics area, right? So if that does happen, what I do like to ask is uh, the parameters. How long is this presentation supposed to be? So I'll kind of keep track because if it turns out to be 20 minutes, and it was only supposed to be five, then I'll let them know that, right? Like, I'll, I'll check on that. Um, also, you know, are they supposed to give a general overview? Are they supposed to give a specific one? Are they supposed to show visuals with it? So, so I'll get to know the parameters so that I could give them the best kind of feedback for it as well. Um, and if it's a work presentation, 
same thing. W what is it you need to do? Who are you going to present this to? And what are the main goals that you want to achieve from this? So that when they're speaking and telling me, then I know. And obviously on these things, if I, if I hear something that I don't understand English wise or pronunciation wise, I'm going to let them know. Probably for something like this, I would not interrupt them. I would again use my note cards <laughs> or paper and I would take notes and then I would go back in afterwards and let them know uh, about those things. Because in these th things, it's also about being prepared. So I don't want to interrupt their flow of conversation. Um, <clears throat> one more I have are debate questions. Uh, I have a student from Korea that loves debate questions. So we get to look at pros and cons, which is great because we can learn about pros and cons, pluses and minuses, advantages and disadvantages, right? So we can go over all of those and look at both sides of an issue. Uh, next one, we have report on the progress of a situation. What I mean about this is if you have example somebody in the IT industry you can ask them what's a current topic that they're dealing with and and how is it going right how's it going and what are they going to do about it what's the next steps it could also be something technical specifically technical or it could just be a general how they're going to organize their 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 organization chart or their actual workflow coming up for maybe some kind of holiday or there's going to be employees going on vacation soon. And the last one I want to explain here has to do with flow charts. So you have professional students, for example, that, that have a job and they can, uh, for you also to learn more about them, is they can explain to you an overview of a flow chart of a process that they do or a process that they work with. Now, if you're unable to, if they're unable to provide one to you, you can of course Google something like this, or even actually in Wikipedia, you can find stuff. This also can go back sometimes to their company website, and it may be located on there. And there's something that you could you could work with. And this is great because you can work with transition words, you know, and so then the first, the second, third. You you can get a lot out of it, and of course pronunciation as well and fluency so that they're actually practicing in there and they're actively in it. All right. So Adam, tell me what questions you have. Um, so um, we had some questions before earlier on in the chat, but I've kind of kept them in the back of my mind. I remember mm. somebody asking before, apologies, I can't remember who asked this question, but it's a very good question, um, which is, uh, addressing uh, mistakes um, and corrections with students um, during the, the speaking time. Um, mm -hmm. And I want to kind of elaborate on that a little bit um, on your last point when you were saying that uh, you kind of give the, the student the opportunity to kind of flow through the conversation without the risk of, of interruption. And uh, I think this is crucial um, because um, it, it seems to have the right intentions to correct the student in the moment. And it's often said that like immediacy is is like key <laughs> with corrections, um, but it's understanding the the best way to deliver that. There are people in the chat who are saying that they they strictly type the corrections without um, without necessarily uh, interrupting them as they're speaking, so they can see it, but it's not kind of stopping them from talking. Um, that's an approach I like to do sometimes with students. I usually say that. You know, if you see a correction you don't understand, ask me and then I'll explain it, but I'm not going to stop you from speaking. Um, and the, the other kind of side effect of, neg of uh, interrupting too soon is, as Michelle mentioned, it, it, it disrupts the flow of a student. It, it can um, not only stop them from finishing their sentence or what they wanted to say, um, but it can also knock their confidence so that they don't want to speak at the risk of making a mistake. Um, you want to empower your student to feel confident to just uh, talk. Um, you don't want them to feel like any moment that they speak, they're going to be cut off for saying something incorrect. Um, so um, I don't know if you have uh, experience with this, Michelle, with with uh, giving corrections and, and guidance on, on grammar. Um, it's definitely important to do it soon, but giving the student space to, to make that mistake or a dozen mistakes in one go and then take a breather afterwards to break that down and explain it. Um, do you have a particular 
process or way of doing this with students? Yeah. So um, again, if it, if it's something like a presentation where they need to give it in one in one instance, I usually will not interrupt them. Um, I do the method like you do, where I put I type notes in the chat box as they're talking. Um, if it's something where they have very few mistakes as they're speaking, I you know let's say they said walk, but it needs to be walks. Um, I will let them continue talking, and I just kind of put in there walks. And I, and I emphasize the S and they'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but if you're having a very fluid conversation, I'd kind of wait until we had that break moment to say walks, you know, Hey, a moment ago, I just want to let you know, it should have been walks and not walks. But, um, again, confidence is key. Yeah. You don't want to, you don't want to interrupt them. And maybe you're wrong. Maybe you think they're going to say something and, and then they say something else. <laughs> so then it actually is, yeah. but yeah. I so, Definitely, um, it, it's it's a little bit of a balance, but usually I won't I won't immediately correct them. Yeah, I, I've definitely had this on the student side as well, where I'll go to say something, um, and I'm corrected before I've even had the chance to finish what I want to say, um, just based on assumption of what the, the teacher thinks I'm going to say, um, and sometimes it might not actually be that; it might actually be something different. So. Um, yeah, just give the student the space to say everything um, it, and then deconstruct it afterwards. Um, changing one tiny word that maybe they um, they misused um, might be pointless when you realize that the entire sentence could have been said in a different way or a shorter way or with a quick expression, you know. So um, you won't know that if unless you give them a space to just get the idea right. Um, so yeah, that's that's a very good point. Um, I definitely agree with that. Great. Any other questions we should address? Um, let's see what people are saying. So um, we've got a lot of people that um, are talking about the the cards, for example, and the idea of a random uh, a random topic, mm -hmm. um, which is is great. And I was going to touch upon this as well, um, but. Um, you you kind of talk about the the more in-depth discussions that you can possibly have with like debating and the pros and cons and then even the more simple aspects of speaking where you can just get someone to tell a story using like flashcards or two or three topics or ideas um and um i think it would be good if you if uh, if we're able to talk about if you have any ideas for identifying um, what students work best for what types of lessons because um, I don't know about you I personally find that um, students who are maybe uh, more reserved or shy or maybe have a lower level of English we had a lot of questions in the chat about this earlier on how to deal with those kinds of situations where you know you have speaking time but maybe the student doesn't um, isn't so forthcoming in speaking um, those structured conversations and those structured topics um, are great for, for those uh, demographic of students because they need that more clear guidance of what it is you're going to be talking about, what the parameters are. Um, and I tend to find that, you know, if you have more talkative, outgoing students, even if their level's not as high, you don't necessarily need the structure as much. You can sort of lean back a little bit, take more of a free-flowing, spontaneous conversation. Um, over time, your awareness for that will just kind of increase for more people you speak to and more students you speak with. But do you have any particular ways you kind of suss out these uh, students yourself, Michelle, how you identify, okay, this student might be better for these types of activities, whereas some students might be better for more open-ended discussions? Right. Um, that's a good question. Thank you. One of the ways I look at it is um, how comfortable are you? Usually the ones, the students that um, are not saying so much, I mean, it's because maybe they don't know the vocabulary because they don't know what to say, um, is I give them a little bit of advantage, <clears throat> meaning I would give them a homework assignment where it gives them time. It gives them some time to prepare, to prepare something for me. You know, this is just an example. Uh, maybe it's um, tell me about one really cool place to visit in your city, right? So if that's their homework assignment and then we come into class, 
they're prepared. They, they, they kind of know what's going on. So they're already feeling more comfortable because they had the time, they had the moment to get that together. And then of course, if we need to do corrections or whatever, but um, with that, the student or me, we can also pull up pictures on whatever, whatever this thing is. And we can use the pictures as a visual, right? So we can kind of blend into both sides with something they already very well know about. They've had the moment. And then we can kind of, then they're, to me, they're feeling more comfortable that they don't know stuff. And so for example, um, uh, let's say they show you a picture of, or they talk about going on a, on a boat trip on a river, right? Well, let's then we can also blend into um further further types of water so you could show a picture of a river right so it's very clear this is a river then you could show a picture of an ocean you can show a picture of a lake so you can kind of use pictures to like break it down to make them feel more comfortable in in my opinion so setting them up to start the class where they're comfortable they're pretty solid on a topic usually will make things go better in my opinion mm. okay great Good. Anything else? We've got uh, a good question here from um, Aswani, who wants to know ideas for uh, conversations, but with uh, kids or children, because um, the the kind of way you approach that lesson will be completely different, um, and it does require a completely different skill set. I find to work with children as opposed to adult learners, um, but the skills you're teaching them are going to be very similar, but the approaches you have to take are very different. Um, I don't have much experience with teaching children. I, I tend to focus more on adult learners, but I know Michelle, you um, do have some experience with, with, with kids on the platform. So how do you go about those lessons? Um, I would maybe start each class with a show and tell where they bring something and they tell you about it and then you can ask questions. So maybe it's their favorite toy uh, you can say, well, oh, uh, who gave you this toy? How long have you had it? Uh, does does your bear have a name, right? Uh, you can you can ask questions like that. And then you can also ask like physical stuff. What color is the bear? Um, how many legs does he have? He has two legs. Do you have two legs, right? You can kind of use that. Um, also think about games they may like, you know, ask them what's your favorite game? What's your favorite class in school? Um, what what kind of snacks do you have in school? Do you have a cafeteria? So you have to kind of think back of like what what they would see and experience in in a typical school day or what they're involved involved with. Um, and pictures pictures work very well with them too. As in, for example, these that I have here. It could be words. It could be just pictures. Again, um, you know, for example, here living room right? Do you have a living room? Do you, do you have a couch? Do you have a couch in your living room? So you can get a lot of vocabulary and speaking out of that. Mm. Okay, good. Very good. Okay. All right. Well, just a few other points I want to make is, um, so once you go through a lesson or several lessons, it's really good to check in with a student and ask them, hey, are you, know, are you achieving your goals? Is, is this working with you? Uh, because I think it's important to to do a continual checkup with them because there there may be things that they need to change to and didn't know you know maybe something's different with their job or maybe they decided to go study in Spain so um, they need to learn more about travel something like that um, but and goal goals change uh, sometimes maybe that when they start with you that's not what they needed you know now their boss is like hey you're now going to be giving a presentation every week right so their goals may change uh, due to influences from other things other than you so always check in and ask okay so um wrapping it up here with my end um this is my contact information i'm teacher michelle again i'm from the united states here's my uh teacher id number as well as the link of where you can find me and to just keep in mind um, a great quote from Dr. Seuss, think left and think right and think low and think high. Oh, the thinks you can think up if you only try. So again, uh, be creative in your classes, try stuff and just ask for feedback. And then that way you'll know if those are really important or correct activities for your students. So don't be afraid, all right? Great, some great tips there. Thank you, Michelle, for sharing. Thank you. Um,
thank you everyone for the questions so far. Uh, keep the questions coming in. Um, we're gonna keep the, uh, the conversation going. Um, so I'm gonna hand over um, chat chat duty to Michelle to keep an eye on. So uh, Michelle's gonna be keeping an eye on what people are saying, what people are talking about. Um, whilst I start to uh, present. So my aspect of today's presentation um, is going to be taken from a student perspective. So um, Michelle has gone into some really great uh, tips from a teacher perspective. Um, these methods that I'm going to be speaking about today are more focused on uh, what I've learned from being a student. Um, I spent a lot of student time on italki um, with many different teachers. And so as someone who's very focused on self-study with languages, um, I found that some of these methods and strategies you can actually implement in the classroom as a teacher and they work very well. These are more creative ways of teaching. Um, there are more traditional ways of approaching language learning. So um, you don't have to necessarily take everything from this aspect of the presentation as, as a rule to follow, but maybe it will give you some inspiration of some ways you can experiment with, with your lessons and with your students as well. So I'm going to break this down into three different areas. So uh, the what, the how, and the why. So I'm going to talk about this in terms of uh, awareness, and Michelle uh, mentioned this as well. Um, I'm going to look about different ways to acquire and retain language so that um, you're not only teaching the student, but you're helping the student retain that knowledge and, and keep hold of it and make sure that it's readily available when they want to use it. Um, and then some re uh, some resources and some exercises that uh, maybe push your students a little bit further, uh, particularly if they're more advanced. Um, and so also some little fun games that, that you can play using everyday objects or everyday things around you as well. So uh, let's have a look at awareness first of all. And so um, Michelle was absolutely right earlier. So every student is completely unique. Everyone has a different goal. Um, in terms of uh, understanding student awareness, um, it's about not only understanding the student in front of you as a teacher, but helping the student to understand their own level and where they are and help them to understand uh, what it is they want to do in the language, where they want to go. So to do this, it's, it's really crucial to identify um, what the student can do, what they can do really well, and what they find difficult. What are the, the missing pieces um, that will help them have a better overview of, of language? And then you have to also consider what they want to do in the language. You have to think about what are the actual uh, reasons they have for the lessons. Some may be personal, but some will have very specific needs. And so you don't want to spend too long talking in um, or about certain subjects that the student might find um, or may never speak about. Um, the language is only um, effective for them if they can use it for things that they, they need to and want to talk about. Um, if you teach them about something that maybe they're not so interested in or they're never going to speak about, they'll never feel fluent because they're never going to use that aspect of the language as frequently. And then it's understanding the progress, monitoring um, not only the, the student's progress, but also your progress as a mentor, as a tutor. Um, are you still keeping that student on the path that they, they want to go down? And has the path changed at all? Have they changed any of their goals? Uh, helping them realize that, um, which is super important for keeping students motivated and also disciplined as well. Okay, so um, this is a little quick one from me, but I, I found that um, there are some certain aspects of uh, language retention which uh, really work wonders for uh, keeping certain words and phrases um, in the active part of your mind. Um, I can't really take credit for this. This is uh, developed from other polyglots and language learners. Um, this is this idea is kind of discussed in this book called uh, Fluent Forever. 
I cannot remember the author, so if anyone remembers it, put it in the chat. Um, it's a great book, um, but this is probably one of the key lessons I learned from that book, which I apply in my own language learning, but I also apply as a teacher when I'm trying to guide my students as well. And so I've kind of broken this down into like different tiers. So third, second, and first. Third being somewhat effective, um, but maybe you don't retain that information as much. And then first place being um, what you would want to aim for, ways of really retaining uh, words and phrases and, and language as well. So if a student does not know a word or a phrase, uh, the first, first thing that they will more than likely do, and I'm guilty of this myself, um, is to look for some sort of translation. And uh, technology has come a, a long way, and it's made it very accessible to access translation information very quickly um, and very effectively. So uh, whether that be like Google Translate um, or even uh, language dictionaries that you may have on your phone or conjugation apps. There's a dozen of different apps that will give you the, the, the literal meaning of what it is you want to say. So you look at word A, and it turns it into word B for you. and it's done the work for you. Um, this is good for really quick words that you need to find, but it's not gonna help you retain the word. It, it's gonna be very loose in your mind. You're probably going to forget it very quickly in the long run, although you get the word immediately to use. It's a very short-term gain. Uh, Long-term gains are quite limited with it. So students might often feel quite uh, uncomfortable in a lesson when there's silence or a word they don't know, they might reach for the dictionary straight away. Um, give the student confidence to say that, okay, you know, if you don't know it, that's fine. You can, you can tell me, I'm, I'm going to guide you through this. Um, we'll have the patience to do it. So let's find out what that word is together. Let's find out what the meaning is. Uh, let's discover that. Um, and I'm going to guide you on that process. Rather than the student feeling the pressure to quickly grab the word just for the sake of keeping the conversation going, so we kind of talked about this with children um, and teaching children as well, but a much better way to retain information is through sensory cues. So the most obvious one is visual, but you can also tie this to um, any kind of audio or even a smell or feeling. Um, visual is probably the most obvious one. So if I were to think of um, an example, I could say, for example, if I have a, a book here, for example, um, if I see the book, I will think of the word in whichever language, um, and then that creates a bridge in my mind to that word. Um, you want to kind of do this with your students. You want to create bridges to uh, different words and phrases so that their meanings uh, are linked, not just to the translation, but to the actual direct object or idea or thought. So you can do this with, with anything, really. You can do it with actual objects in a more basic sense, but you can also do it with ideas and concepts as well by looking at uh, visual information um, or situations as well. Um, if your student does this, they're much more likely to retain that information. And so Michelle mentioned this with like the flashcards. Some people in the chat mentioned it with paintings. You know, if you see that uh, visual image, it's going to keep in your mind much better. Um, we're sort of taking out the middleman, so to speak. Like if you want to think of a word or a concept, rather than thinking of the word in your native language and then translating it to something else, you are simply cutting out that translation process and just building a direct connection to another word with that object. The best way beyond that though is uh, to make it personal if you have some kind of personal connection to that idea or thing or object um, you are going to retain that a lot uh, more vividly than through any other sensory cue or direct translation so people in the chat mentioned using photos um, to i feel somebody in the chat who mentioned using photos uh, their own photos with students to describe what uh, is happening in them and to help talk about them and to go through that information. Uh, that, that will work really well because it's a sensory cue. They're going to retain that information because they're going to 
uh, think about an image in their mind and keep that um, keep that with the with the new phrases or vocab. But if you can make it in a personal connection, um, the students building a connection to something they've experienced or know, they're going to retain that a lot uh, a lot more. So with the example with the photos, for example, uh, rather than using your own photos, you could use your students' photos. Or if you're talking about uh, objects and you show them a, like a photo, um, say, for example, if you're learning the word for like uh, different pets and you learn the word for the dog, um, in the, the third tier, so translation, you would just be learning the word um, in whichever language uh, that might be. Um, if it's sensory, you're going to be showing them an image of a dog. It's much more clear. They have a very good concept now of what that looks like and in what situations to use it correctly. Uh, but then if it's personal, it's going to be even stronger. So if it's their own dog or their own cat, they're now going to associate that word with something personal to them um, and something that is regularly in their mind. So it's going to retain a lot more. So that's one bit of guidance when it comes to uh, going through situations where maybe you um, you find that the student doesn't know words or phrases and you want to help them remember them long term, try and find a way of, of doing this. I'm going to give some examples and exercises as we go through this presentation, but this is just the key concept, I suppose, <laughs> of how to do it. Um, so Adam, I'd like to interrupt you for a moment. Um, first of all, Hannah Yu has said, good point, multi-sensory theory. And also I have a question I would like to address with you. Um, someone else asked, I would be interested in how much time all of you spend on lesson preparation and admin stuff. Mm. What do you think, Adam? Mm. So <laughs> somebody um, mentioned this in the chat. I think it was Ralph who mentioned this. Um, in an answer as well. Uh, so other students have been contributing to the questions as well, which is great. So from my perspective, uh, I kind of agree with what uh, Ralph's answer to this was earlier, which was um, when you first start out as a teacher, um, you'll probably spend a fair bit of time on lesson prep. Um, as time goes on, though, you'll become a lot more efficient at it just because by nature, it will be very routine for you. And so for me now, I can probably put a lesson plan together in about five or 10 minutes um, with the correct resources in place. Um, it depends on the student though. Um, so for some students who um, I have a very strong understanding of their ability, I might not plan so heavily because I know that I can adjust on the fly very naturally without slowing down the lesson too much. If it's a student where I think that there are going to be some hurdles or some challenges. Um, if, for example, I think that they may need more structure um, and a more clear plan for the lesson, um, I'll take five or 10 minutes before the class to uh, pop down some bullet points uh, on what that lesson is going to look like. And I usually break it down in terms of an introduction into the topic or idea just to, to break into it and to kind of get warmed up. Um, I'll then go into some sort of um, uh, passive uh, information where you're absorbing or taking an idea in. Um, and then uh, two forms of activities. So one which would be um, to test their, their knowledge of it in some way. Um, and then the other one, the other activity would usually be constructive, which would be taking that idea and concept and actually building it from scratch to show me that you've understood it. Um, and for more specific exercises, um, there'll be some really good ones in in a moment. But that's kind of the lesson plan idea. That's the approach I take with it. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Um, as for me, it it depends on the you know it it depends on the student and uh, what what we're doing. But um, as Adam was talking about too, is actually I I kind of collect stuff too. So for example, Halloween. Halloween was a very popular topic. Thanksgiving is a very popular topic. So I've collected things and I've saved things in a Word document. I've saved li really good links. So sometimes it's not even about preparing for a particular student, it's about preparing in general. I, I will go go through and I will see things on the internet 
uh, all week long. And I'm like, wow, that's a great topic to talk about with this student, right? And we haven't even had a class, you know, scheduled yet. But I know that that coming up, that would be a really good topic. So it's kind of like it never really stops as and, and just keeping things too and saving things for the future. It will also cut down on lesson planning time. Mm, yeah, absolutely. There's, there's probably a dozen bookmarks that I have on uh, news articles and blogs for current events, which uh, usually make for some very interesting topics or discussions. And the quirkiness of them or the bizarre nature of the topics uh, means that the student is more likely to remember it and remember what they're learning about because it, is, it can be such a, such a strange concept. So like, for example, there's a, <laughs> probably one of my favorite lessons uh, or subjects to talk about uh, when it comes to art um is uh stories about um botched art attempts in yeah. in certain countries uh, to restore paintings that have failed um it creates some very funny um very funny images and topics that you can talk about and because it, it has some kind of emotional response uh, it, the student's much more likely to to remember it because it's quite quite quirky quite funny and quite unique so um yeah just keep Keep your eye open for curious and absurd things that are happening around you, um, things that might be interesting or um, what's the word, uh, current in terms of um, the events, like Michelle was saying, world events or holidays are great ones. So yeah, just uh, create like a bookmark folder, put them to one side. They're always there if you need them in future. Great, thank you, continue. Awesome. So, uh, which way are we going? This way. Okay. So, um, <laughs> when it comes to um, when it comes to actually thinking about uh, language as a whole and um, identifying where the student wants to go, um, a lot of students will will set quite quite wide goals sometimes, or maybe they don't know what their goal is, um, and so they might need some guidance with um, creating a, a, a solid. Uh, a solid goal or a solid plan. Some students will tell you that you know I want to take lessons because I want to I want to do business English or um, I'm having a job interview. These are very specific scenarios. It's very clear the steps you might need to take to get there, um, or at least you have a destination that to aim for. But sometimes students will cast their net out quite wide, and there won't really be a clear goal, but um, it will be phrased as such. So, for example. You might get one student that might say, "I want to, I want to uh, be fluent, or I want to speak completely without uh, an accent." Um, and so, they're quite wide goals, and so it sometimes helps to to narrow down um, and to think about the the smaller scale rather than the big scale of the actual language, because um, language is quite expansive; it's ever changing. There's always new to learn even as a native speaker and so if you if you kind of look at it from a perspective of I've got all of this stuff to learn it's going to feel like you're making a mountain out of a molehill and incredibly difficult and it's going to be really difficult to stay motivated in that kind of situation you won't feel like you're making any progress so I like to narrow down goals into very small chunks that will help keep people uh, motivated, disciplined, and give them a sense of accomplishment as well. So the way I like to think about this concept is a, is a wall. So think of the language itself as a wall that you can build either uh, long or tall. And every time that you discuss a, a topic or an idea or you become more confident with something, you're essentially building a, a brick to that wall. So an example of this could be cooking, for example. maybe you want to be able to read uh, recipes so that you can cook a particular type of cuisine um, or that um, you want to you want to open a restaurant or something. Um, so you, you'd have a very specific idea or topic. You, you create a, a block that, of an idea that you then understand. Uh, you then, over time, once you become 100% with that idea, you can place that block on a wall of other ideas and uh, concepts. Um, so this is a great way of, of identifying with students what it is they want to learn, what are the key parts of the language that they need to get them to where they need to go, because for every student it's going to be different. For some students, 
Um, you could talk about uh, like music or travel, but it might not have much of a benefit to them. It will make their language better because they'll be learning about more topics, but they won't feel stronger in that language because maybe they won't talk about those topics in real world scenarios as often. So it's about identifying what parts of the wall you need structurally for the student to get to where they need to go and then identifying any gaps in the wall where you might need to focus on a, an idea or a concept to, to strengthen it. So here are some exercises that I like to do uh, to, to build that wall using some of the ideas and concepts that uh, we looked at earlier. Uh, so I have six in total. Um, first one was photos. We talked about this a bit earlier, but there's another great way you can do this exercise. Um, somebody mentioned that they like to use paintings and have students describe them because they're very vivid. And as we looked at earlier, that'd be a great example of a, a sensory learning activity. If you wanted to make it personal, uh, I like to take uh, photographs or ask students to bring photos to the class. Um, they don't need to be very complicated because you can make you can make them as complicated as you want to. It's understanding the right questions to ask with the students. So for a, a more basic level, I might ask the student to just talk to me about what is right in front of them, what they see, uh, what was happening that day, or what they think was happening. If the student is more advanced and maybe they want to practice certain vocabulary, I might say, okay, can you describe this aspect of the photo to me? And you can sort of narrow down on a very specific area of that photo. Uh, maybe there's different faces in the photo and you say, okay, can you describe what this person looks like compared to this person um, or what they're wearing? Uh, but I want you to describe it. Um, and then we give you some descriptions and you say, okay, now I want you to do it again, but not using those words. Do you know alternative words that you can use instead for that? and see if they can still do that exercise. Um, it will be a, it'll be a bit of a test for some students. You can uh, tailor this depending on their level. So you can tell when they're finding it too difficult or where the sweet spot is for engagement with the student. So that's, that's one I like to use. Uh, another one, um, hey, this so one's quite fun, and this one can be good. Oh, Adam, go on. Actually, I, wanna, I wanna bring up a question because I think it could, could go into uh, your last point and the next point. So the question yeah. is from Floor and is how to make my students understand that grammar is important. They want to have conversations but don't know anything about grammar. So how would you kind of pull mm. that into photos as an example? So with, with grammar, there's kind of, um, oops, wrong way. Um, there's kind of two ways to, to go about this. Um, so there's a kind of school of thought that you could take a more traditional approach and actually uh, ask a student, what do you know about this grammar rule? Can you explain the rules of it? Um, personally, I don't find this as effective um, because um, we don't think in terms of rules when we're speaking. As I'm speaking right now, I'm not thinking to myself, okay, time for the present tense, time for past tense, time for, for continuous and this and that and the other. It's very natural and I've, I've learned this from context and understanding when it's appropriate and when it's not appropriate. Um, and so I like to take that same approach. Um, you will always have exceptions to a lot of grammar rules. And so um, if a student wants to know, you can explain to them why. And if they, if they want to know why, you can explain it. But um, for example, with like photos or any of the other exercises really, um, it's about context. Um, so if the student, for example, has some understanding, you can say, okay, look at this photo, tell me what happened that day, and it's going to be in a certain tense. Or um, you could say, tell me a story about a time where you're going to be in this place. Like, you, if you want to go around the future, what would you do if you um, went there? Um, and then you're practicing a different tense. And then you can kind of go through corrections with the student in that moment and they'll associate those corrections and that story with the photo. But if, for example, the student has almost no awareness of the grammar, uh, which can sometimes happen, um, it's about um, it's about A-B testing with the student. So you might show them a, uh, uh, an idea, like I could say, for example, what have I got around? If I say, okay, if I have like a 
cactus here. <laughs> um, I, I could say, like, for example, um, yes or no questions and say, like, is this green or something? And the student would say uh, yes or no, because they're just going to guess. It's a 50-50 chance. Um, if they get it right, correct, you are right. And the student's going to have that um, reinforcement. OK, that's what, what green is. And you give them another situation. Is this, is this also green? Yes or no? And you mentioned this kind of like with the, the sofa analogy earlier with like uh, it has like four legs. How many legs do you have? It's, it's giving those yes or no A or B style questions um, until the student has it in enough situations where they kind of understand the concept. Um, and then you kind of focus on any irregularities that might happen. It's a more natural way of learning. Typically, children will learn this way. They're just corrected from, from, from adults and parents, um, and they won't know any different. Um, just encourage the student to make the mistake and keep, uh, keep um, asking them those uh, yes or no questions. That's, those are great situations for closed questions. Um, because it will give them more situational awareness. So that's how I like to do it. Personally. Great, great. Um, and just to expand a little bit on that, sometimes what I'll do is if I hear or see in writing one particular sentence that, uh, that there's a uh, that there's uh, something that there's an error, basically, is I will actually write it, I will write it exactly what I heard. And what I will ask the student, well, tell the student, I said, something needs to change. What, is, what needs to change in here? And then to see if we can actually find it, right? Um, and it gives them the opportunity to look at something singularly, right? So we don't have to go through everything. And then that kind of keeps it in mind as we go on. Oh, it should be walks, not mm. walk, right? Yeah. I, I, um, I see some comments here as well. Um, one from uh, Karina. Um, actually, um, uh, I will probably elaborate on this slightly. So um, to be completely clear, um, grammar is important. I think the, the way you utilize the lesson time for grammar, though, is, is the difference. Um, you could use the hour to, uh, to give like a, a lecture or exercises about the grammar. Um, I prefer to give the resources for the student to go through that in their own time. And then in the lesson, um, use that opportunity to, to experiment with the grammar and to, to use it in those uh, real world contexts or scenarios. Um, I'm a massive grammar nerd myself. I read grammar books all the time on different languages. Um, but I find that when I'm in the lesson as a student, um, I, I don't find it as effective when the teacher goes through with me unless there's a specific concept about it I don't understand. Um, I much prefer to use that time to, to just play around with it and kind of see what works, what doesn't, when it's right, when it's wrong. And with those, uh, with the negative and positive reinforcement, it will help uh, me retain it, basically. Um, OK, um, any other questions? Any Anything else people would like to know? I think we're right now. Continue. Awesome. OK, um, so uh, reconstruction is another exercise I like to, uh, I like to do, uh, more so as a student. But you can give this one as homework. Uh, it's a bit more interactive, a bit more fun. Um, and again, this will be dependent on your students' interests or what they like. Um, so you can tailor it a little bit depending on what they are engaged with. And if it is something they're engaged with, they're more likely to do the homework because it's something that they naturally f like or find entertaining anyway. So uh, an example of this, I used cooking before in a previous slide uh, for a concept or an idea you could focus on. An idea of a reconstruction exercise for that could be, uh, OK, I'm going to send you uh, a recipe for a uh, particular dish in another language. And what I want you to do is to read that recipe. I want you to try and create the recipe using just what it says in the, in the language. And the test of whether you can do it or not is uh, going to be evident as you, <laughs> as you taste the dish afterwards. Um, another example could be, uh, you know, maybe the, the student is interested in art and you say, OK, I'm going to send you a, a tutorial, a video tutorial on how to draw um, a plant or something like a five minute snippet where someone's guiding you through that process and they're using the terminology uh, in English. Uh, and I want you to, to go listen to that and follow along and see if you can do uh, and do just that. 
Um, and because the student is creating a personal experience with the language and they're engaging with it, um, they're going to recognize things that they understand, concepts they don't understand, um, and it's going to help reinforce that in their mind. Um, so this is one that I've personally found useful as a student when, and a way that I like to learn. Um, and it can be really great for students who maybe don't necessarily like to use textbooks as much. Maybe they're more practical in their learning. You can give them these sort of fun little activities uh, to to retain that to retain that knowledge. Um, another good one uh, is stories. So I like to uh, use this particularly with uh, students who might find it difficult with any kind of improvisation. So you may find or encounter some students who are very, very good at constructing sentences or, or grammar or using the language correctly, but maybe they're just not creative people when it comes to free writing. Maybe if you ask them to write a story or an experience um, or a diary about something, maybe they think, oh, I don't know what's interesting. I don't know what to talk about. Um, and for, for some students, you can give them an exercise where rather than creating something from scratch, you're taking something that already exists and you're just asking the student to manipulate it using the language that they know. So um, a, an example of a way you can do this with like a creative writing task, sometimes you can take like a, a novel or an extract for a book, maybe like a half a page or a page if they're more advanced. Um, and it can be like a very simple story or an idea. And you can say, okay, uh, we've got this story already, so you don't need to create the story, but I want you to change the context. Um, maybe I want you to change the ending, or maybe I want you to change it so that uh, in this story it has a happy ending. Maybe I want you to write a sad ending, or uh, everyone's really sad in this story. I want you to make it so that everything that happens is positive or happy, and use different uh, vocabulary to express that. <laughs> or um, the uh, even like you could use this for learning a range of vocabulary. So you could use this for adjectives or verbs. Like if a student struggles to use uh, different word choices for verbs, maybe they default to the most basic forms of the verbs. You could say, okay, every time a verb comes up, I want you to change it. Um, and so instead of words like uh, speak or run or walk, they have to use more, um, more creative ways of expressing that idea or concept. Um, I tend to use this exercise more for students who want to use and practice vocabulary and expand it more. Um, it's definitely not an exercise that you do with every single student. It has a very niche purpose, um, but it's one that uh, some students will find quite entertaining, quite fun. Okay. Um, so uh, I've got three more, um, and I'll kind of uh, wrap up and conclude uh, my section of the presentation. So. Commentary is another one I like to look at as a speaking exercise. Um, and this one's a sensory exercise. Um, it's definitely more for advanced learners. Um, it can be quite challenging for uh, beginners. So I would use this sparingly if a student really wants to be challenged in a way. Um, you can use small videos, maybe two to five minutes, um, and you can play them with the student and you have some form of sensory information happening. You have uh, uh, something happening on screen. I would keep it so that it's something basic and something that you can understand with the video muted so that the context is still quite evident and clear. So an example of this could be um, there's a YouTube channel where um, all it is are snippets of um, a person's perspective walking through a city, for example. They're very simple videos. Um, they're usually used as like relaxa relaxation videos. Um, like you'll see, for example, um, 20 minutes of me walking through the streets of London or something. And you don't have to watch a whole 20 minutes, just like two minutes or three minutes. But during that time, you're gonna see someone's perspective walking through a city or a place. Um, and as you're watching it, you could pause the video at certain moments and say, okay, can you describe to me what you're seeing, what's happening? as the video is actually playing in real time. And for some students, this is gonna be really difficult. So if it's challenging, you can pause the video, give them time and space to, to, to speak. If they're more advanced, 
maybe you play the video in slow motion. So if the video is still playing, but um, they have to think a little bit quicker with the words. Um, and then you can engage with them and ask questions. Oh, what, how, how would you describe that car to me? Or what does that building look like? Or what do you think it is? Uh, what, what do you think people might go there for? Um, and it's like a sensory experience. Um, and if those videos exist for where you're from, maybe you can kind of give like virtual tours <laughs> of uh, where you're from or interesting places. You can also do this with certain museums as well. They actually give you virtual tours if you search on my website and you can look at the different paintings. I know the Louvre did this uh, recently for certain galleries and exhibitions. And so maybe you can go on a virtual tour um, together and talk about that experience. Um, and the student would hopefully retain that a lot more having had that experience rather than just being taught the word directly. Um, another one on here, this is more of a constructive exercise. And this is another good one for, for optional homework as well, uh, is to document and to, to actively engage and use the language uh, yourself as you're um, in, in current world situations. So one way you can do this is uh, not everyone likes writing. Uh, some people find it more comfortable to speak and vice versa. So if it's writing, maybe you can ask them to uh, write about a journal entry or an experience. Um, if maybe they want to practice speaking more, um, you can ask them to um, record themselves, <laughs> which might seem a bit strange. And some students will find this uncomfortable. But um, if you ask a student to persist with it, it's really good way to me measure and monitor student progress because you don't have to watch the video in the moment. It's more about just capturing the uh, the student in that particular moment in time. So I like to do this myself with other languages. I might just uh, take my phone, uh, have two minutes just talking to it, uh, maybe uh, about my day or what I'm doing or what's on my mind. Um, and then I'll stop recording, I'll put it to one side, I might not even watch it, um, and it will just kind of sit there. And then a few weeks later, uh, or a few months later, I can go back and I can actually watch that back and compare it to other videos and see my progress, kind of similar to how athletes might monitor their progress with photos. Um, it's a really good way to motivate your students because you can see like, oh look, in this uh, previous week, you were really struggling to, to talk about this. And now you're a lot more confident with your speaking. You're using this grammar correctly or using this word correctly. Um, and it can give the student the awareness of, oh, I am, I am making progress. I should keep, keep up with this. I should uh, stay committed because I'm going to, I'm seeing results. Um, so the student doesn't necessarily have to watch it. Um, they can if they want. <laughs> it's more about just, uh, capturing the moment. Uh, some students, um, some teachers, in fact, I should say, and in fact, I'm looking to to do this with one of my own teachers, um, is to actually record a lesson um, while speaking to the teacher. And we're just going to put that to one side. We're going to use it afterwards to uh, as a kind of benchmark to see how I've improved over time. Um, if you are more confident with sharing your language experience with others, uh, which I would encourage because the more you can interact with people, the more you can engage with a language, the much more likely you are to uh, to keep studying and to learn it is uh, some people do create uh, study grams um, where it's essentially an Instagram just dedicated to studying. <laughs> so you'll, pay, you'll post up your little 30 second snippets of you talking about different subjects on Instagram and you can either in invite and encourage people to either participate and to join in the conversation with you, um, or you can invite them for uh, for corrections and guidance as well. Um, and italki also has features for this for students who want to practice writing, where you can create notebook and journal entries, where teachers and students can then actively engage and correct and join in the discussion which is a much more engaging way to practice and use the language. So this is another good one that I like to use a lot. Well, Adam, a lot of people are agreeing with you. They really like that activity. Oh, great. <laughs> Glad to hear. Um, it's, um, it's one that um, is always quite, uh, quite strange. And 
Um, it's it's one of those ones where I, I will watch videos of myself back um, from months ago and think, oh my God, what am I even saying? <laughs> um, and in your mind, you think, oh, I'm, I'm so eloquent with my with how I'm speaking right now. And when you watch it back and you, you can't even string a whole sentence together it, and it kind of uh, gives you that uh, kind of sense of reality in a way. So, um, so yeah. So, so we're at about 10 minutes left. So what else would you like to add today? So there's only really one other aspect. So it's kind of timed quite nicely. So the last one, I, I've, I've captioned it as, as mutate. But the, the idea and the concept behind this is to basically uh, experiment as much as possible with these exercises, concepts, and ideas. They're not clear structures that you kind of, or recipes that you follow to every single step. Um, every student is different. Every student's going to have their own challenges. Um, and it's more about experimentation. It's about taking these ideas and concepts and thinking, okay, what can you put together? What can you uh, shift and create? Because uh, language isn't, isn't like this uh, clear construction. Um, it's, it's very malleable with how we use it and in what situations we use it in. Like for example, speaking as a concept uh, is quite clear what it requires but the skills that are required for having a conversation versus giving a presentation or a job interview, um, or uh, if you're like an actor or something and you want to perform in front of people, you would say, okay, they all involve speaking, but the skills involved are completely different. And so um, it's the idea that when you're learning language, you should have this idea in your mind that it is something to experiment with and play around with. It's not a, a clear set of um, one size fits all. So you can take some of these concepts and ideas and mesh and combine them together. You can um, get a student to write a, a diary entry one week as part of a construction exercise. And then the following week, you could get them to uh, change their, their story. Um, and then you're using one of the, the previous exercises we looked at before or maybe you get them to change the words in, in ways we looked in some other exercises. Or maybe uh, you get the student to do a reconstruction exercise where they follow uh, like, a, um, like a cooking tutorial, like I mentioned before. And then in another lesson, they talk about their experience and you're combining that with another skill set that we talked about before. It's about playing around and just experimenting and just having fun with it. Because um, every student's gonna be different and um, everyone's going to have their own way of learning. And the only way you're going to learn that uh, and develop with the student is if you um, is if you play around with it. And um, if you enjoy that process, um, your students are going to have a lot more engagement with the language. They're going to want to learn. They're going to commit. Um, and ultimately, um, they're going to keep learning. They're going to have fun. And that's well, what it's all about. <laughs> um, there's no point learning the language if you don't enjoy it. Um, you want to make it as engaging as uh, memorable as possible. So right, that's right. what I meant. And I absolutely agree with you, um, Adam, that um, to keep students engaged, have them enjoy the lessons. And it's all about finding out what their interests are, what engages them, what motivates them in order to uh, keep the lessons, uh, keep the lessons going, giving good quality and where everybody is, is understanding at the same time. And I think that's great. So you have a practical side and you have a creative side. And so we just really need to combine them with whatever works best with the students' learning needs, right? Mm, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so just, um, just encourage the student to discover their preferred way of learning um, and have fun exploring that. You don't need all the answers straight away with students. Um, it's it's a it's a process and it's a journey for you as much as it is for the, for the student. And if you're clear and transparent with the student about that, um, they will be more dedicated to you as a teacher if they can see that you're adapting to their needs rather than if you're trying to fit them into your own template as a teacher. So, yeah, that's right. what I would I'd suggest as a final thought. <laughs> Well, um, we're at the end, Adam. Um, I think it's been a great webinar today. What do you think? 
Yeah, I think um, I think it's been a really good uh, conversation. We've had some really good questions um, and a really good discuss discussion as well in the chat. Um, so thank you everyone who's participated. Thank you everyone for sharing your questions and your thoughts and ideas. Um, it's um, it's been good. I've I've really enjoyed uh, spending time with everyone today and, and chatting with you, Michelle. And yeah. I'd just like to thank uh, Italki as well and everyone on my Italki team for allowing us to host this webinar as well. Yes, thank you so much to everyone that attended today and thank you to italki. It's been great. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, guys. Have a good day.